We'll turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 32. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers uh, to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. Where I am thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the, the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come? In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall the Christ come out of Galilee? I'm going to ask um, the presenter if he could come back up and if we could sing three more verses from the psalm we just sung, Psalm 42, to the same tune as the presenter there. I don't have my glasses on. Thanks. Would you mind, brother? Um, I, I need a moment for something. Um, if we could sing Psalm 42 uh, from verse 6 to 8. My God, my soul's cast down in me. The therefore mind I will from Jordan's land, the Hermonites, and even from Miser Hill. Thank you. Please stand.
seated. John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture is said out of his heart, shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit. So Christ cries out in the temple to provide spiritual satisfaction to our thirst and that that is done by the Holy Spirit of God. Now this is a time of opposition. Um, we've looked at four signs. The fourth was his uh, great sign, and he preached lengthily on it himself, so it deserved us to look at it. Uh, we move into the next chapter of John to see something else imaged before us. This strictly is not one of John's seven miracle signs. You'll, there's no miracle uh, specified in this chapter. Uh, so it's not one of the seven great miracles. But John's gospel has more in it than just those seven miracles. John puts this immediately after chapter 6 for a reason. Uh, the first in, in, in chapter 6 was um, very Christ-centered, Christological. It was about the mediator and his body and blood under that figure of manna. Now you'll have noticed right away that the theme of this chapter is water. Chapter 6 is manna, tangible bread, something physical that came down from heaven. That's Christ. In this chapter, it's water that flows out from that. The Holy Spirit of God. Both are needed and both work together in the Christian and you'll notice the link. Jesus finished his sermon on the Lamb of God and the bread of life by saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. My words are spirit and they are life. So the truth being conveyed to us by John is that in Christ's redemption and his accomplished work on the cross and his resurrection, he fulfills this great legal and covenantal work that blots out our sin. Um, and that transfers a righteousness to us and so on. But that then must be experienced, doesn't it? Um, what comes from Christ after he's done that is the drinking of his, his flesh and blood, or as is seen here, a river of living water. Now you actually see it on the cross. John actually notes it on purpose in, in chapter 19. He was at the cross, and he said that once Jesus had cried out, it is finished. He's pierced by a soldier, and blood and water flow from his side. So we have this understanding of Christ as spoken by the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. You strike the rock in the wilderness, and water gushes forth. You crucify the Son of God, and blood and water come forth. You offer up the Lamb of God and in this chapter we see rivers of water flowing out that are showing us the Holy Spirit. You would have sensed as we read this portion of this chapter the increased animosity and conflict between Christ and the, the Jewish rulers. You know that a lot of people left, you'll remember, at the end of chapter 6. Many departed. We had a sermon on that. Many departed from him in Galilee. He had performed some miracles in Jerusalem, in Judea, in the capital, in the most prominent place, with the highest stakes. 
where the Sanhedrin was, where the theologians were, where the rulers of the Pharisees were, the most opinionated, the most demanding, the most orthodox as they saw it. He healed the man at Bethesda, remember, on the Sabbath. Now here we are, probably a year later, and it's still being discussed. They haven't seen him. Jesus was in Galilee for most of the year. And that's why there's all this uncertainty at the start of the chapter. You'll notice as we read it, there were a lot of questions. Will he come up to the feast? Will he show his face? Not easy to find someone in the ancient world, not like it is today. They hadn't seen him for months. They're hearing about him throughout Galilee. He's not easy to find. And the question at this great feast of tabernacles is, will Jesus come? What will he say? What will he do? How will he answer the accusations that are being put upon him as a Sabbath breaker, as one who makes himself out as equal with God, as one who has some kind of claim to be Christ? And they all have opinions, you noticed. Some say, this is the prophet. Some say, this is the Christ. And if he's not the Christ, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than this man? Others say, he has a demon. He deceives the people. He's not a good man. So there's this division at this great feast of tabernacles. Something like, a, you know, a, a big um, festival, a, a, a large season of fellowship or a revival, something like that. Their Passover was like our communion. Their feast of tabernacles was just a great festival. Its, its civil counterpart in the United States would be something like Thanksgiving. It's an annual end of harvest, end of year feast in which they at least thank God for the provision of all the food and so on. But when Jesus goes up to this feast, this feast means more than a mere thanksgiving. It, it was a remembrance of the Jews going through the wilderness and being kept by God with no permanent abode. So pilgrims, those in transience, those with no fixed and secure place, that they went through the wilderness for 40 years under his chastisement in tents. They had no temple. They had no fixed cities. They had no land of their own. But God kept them all that time. That's a picture of us, brothers and sisters, that we go through this alien world, this world that has an opposing culture to Christ, it is not our home. It is not our fixed abode. We are going through it as like Israel. And we go through it through a period of testing, 40 years. And one day, God willing, all his people will go to the land that flows with milk and honey. The heavenly Jerusalem. The new heavens and the new earth. The perfected creation. The Israel of God. That's the promise. Tabernacles speaks of us in heaven looking back and remembering and being thankful that he took us there. And though we're in a fixed abode in heaven, we remember our time in the tents. So the Jews did this. They were in Jerusalem and they all made booths and hundreds of thousands of people descended upon Jerusalem. They all made booths around the city and they lived in them for a week. And that lasted seven or eight days. Uh, there was an extra day added on called the octave day. That was a kind of wind down day. But the great day of the feast was the seventh. So they all go there. They're fellowshipping in their booths. They're going up to the temple each day to watch the priests in the courtyard. The men are going in. And they're seeing the priests offer up in that week 70 bulls that show the fullness of a perfect sacrifice blood atoning for sin and the priests ministering and the high priest going in and offering blood on the altar to atone for their sin and they all took branches and palm branches of celebration and fruits like lemons and citrus fruits and they all took them up to the temple and and they carried them in each hand and um, they lit the menorah lamps in the courts of the temple to light up Jerusalem during the night to show that the light of God and the pillar of light led them through the wilderness. They are at this feast fellowshipping and there's a lot of talk about Jesus. Now he tells his own brothers he's not going. 
they are worldly and they say go display yourself prove who you are if someone is of God this way he should show himself and display himself Jesus doesn't do that watch that temptation even as a Christian a Christian man or woman displaying yourself trumpeting out uh, the gospel or things to do with the gospel in a prideful displaying fashion that, that isn't appropriate there's a way to do it that's prideful Jesus though he knows he must be known still manages to mingle that with humility and a self-effacing nature he doesn't go up and draw a lot of attention to himself at the beginning he goes up and likely stays in Bethany and we're told in the middle of the feast verse 14 he appears in the temple Jesus doesn't even go to the ceremonies on the first three days but he appears in the middle of the feast and he preaches in the temple and we are told in verse 15 that they were astonished they marveled at his teaching this one hasn't gone to the theological schools of the rabbis this one has not been trained from his youth in Jerusalem how does he know these things how can he speak this way from scripture and so show so much wisdom and light that it arrives at our hearts with an authenticity and reality that the rabbis don't have how did he know these things well we know he learned them in secret with his father where a lot of us must learn even the best theological and seminary students truth be told the the more they learn from a seminary in some way uh, gets in the way sometimes of what they can learn experientially from God the theology of God that's known in its bones but then must be experienced and fleshed out uh, before God in secret so they marvel um, the significance of Jesus's words in our text in verse 37 that on the last day he stood and said if any man thirst was a ceremony that happened every day in that festival and the ceremony was this that the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam and draw water from it in a golden vessel a bucket basically made of gold and there would be a large procession through the city towards the temple with a lo the whole crowd following them and then they would all convene in the great courtyard at the front of the temple and all the priests would be there in white linen dozens of them and one of the priests would have the honor of carrying that golden bucket of water towards the great bronze altar where the bulls were being sacrificed and they all sang together and raised their palm branches and they danced and they chanted in Jehovah's name and the priest then mounted and climbed up onto this large altar and at a certain point there was a funnel that went into the base of the altar where the coals were that as the sacrifice was being offered he would pour that bucket of water into that funnel and an offering of wine into that funnel now neither of those things well the, the water especially was actually prescribed by scripture it was added on but Jesus is there and he used it the rabbis taught remarkably that this pouring was a symbol to them of the Holy Spirit and Jesus knows that and he looks at it and he uses it and he says it's not the bronze altar it's not the golden bucket of water it's not the pool of Siloam that you need there stands one here that you truly do need so he uses that ceremony for this great saying that he cries out in the midst of the temple I want to just bring out three uh, areas of this text for our edification uh, the thirst of man first of all second the pouring of the spirit third the outflow of the heart they're all connected the thirst the pouring of the spirit and then the outflow from the heart first the thirst that we have the thirst of man now Jesus sees this ceremony and it was all enacted by the priests to symbolize our spiritual thirst 
That's why they draw this water out. That's why they bring it to the altar and they pour it upon the altar along with the sacrifice. Uh, They believe that it images in some way the Holy Spirit. Now they get that from the Old Testament because God's word teaches us truly that in spite of this ceremony that they did, we know that God's Spirit himself reveals to us in his word that that is who he is. That's what he does. For example, in our call to worship this morning, Isaiah 55, Ho to everyone that thirsteth, let him come to the waters and drink. Let him who is hungry buy wine, buy milk and so on, without money, without price. This great feast of God's covenant that is fully opened up in the gospel. It was partially given to Israel in a kind of visible form, but it really gets going when the new covenant arrives and it's the Holy Spirit that is revealed as the provision. That in the New Testament, um, God's tent, God's feast is open to all men. You'll notice in Jesus' words in our text, that Jesus says, if any man thirst. Uh, and he means that emphatically. It's anyone. He, sta- he st- stands up in the temple and he cries out indiscriminately, anyone at all. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter how knowledgeable they are. It doesn't matter what sins they've committed. It doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter if they're Jew or Gentile. Anyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink, which is very exclusive and profound. Anyone can come, but there aren't a hundred gates for them to come through. There aren't a hundred men that can help them in human history. There aren't a hundred ways and there aren't ten religions by which you can receive even some of this water. It's that great contrast. It's the 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 liberal generosity of God's gospel to anyone who's born into this world can come. But there's only one Son of God. He's the only one that could ever say, Come to me. Come to me. Moses can't say that. Daniel can't say that. Paul can't say that. And as much as any minister or elder would seek to help you and encourage you and read the word with you, there will come a point where where that leaves off and the answer will have to be, you need to go to the Lord. Because it's come unto me, anyone who thirsts. Man is thirsty. That's the import of this this very central word from Jesus' mouth. If anyone thirsts, he says, read your Old Testament. Ho to him who thirsts. Isaiah 44, I will pour out water on him who is thirsty. I will pour out my spirit on him who is thirsty. Water will burst forth in the wasteland and make it like Eden. Anyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now the Jews would say, well, in the wilderness we were thirsty and water had to come from the rock and we praise God that that took place in history. And we get thirsty, but we have the Pool of Siloam, we have the Jordan River, we have the Sea of Galilee, we have, there are, there's water and we have what we need from God. You ask these folks in that temple, do you have what you need? They say yes. Yes, I have what I need. I I have the Torah. I have the priests. We have the temple and our our tabernacle booths. And we have our way of life um, in which we follow the ways of the Lord from, from our Old Testament. And we have prayer and we have offering and we have vows. And we make sacrifices for God. And we fast. And... We have what we need. Sometimes life is hard, but God is with us. We are, as the Old Testament says, as Deuteronomy says, or as Exodus, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But it's all outward. 
They were God's covenantal royal priesthood, but many of them were not sons of God. John tells us at the beginning of his gospel, to them and to us, John 1 verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. They all thought they were born of God, including Peter and John and so on. They just thought being Jewish was being born of God. But they're not. Jesus himself says solemnly in this chapter, Him ye know not. Him ye know not. You don't know my Father. You're thirsty. You think you have all this, but you're thirsty. And dear friend, dear man or woman, whoever listens to this, we're all thirsty. I am right now, even though I believe all things being equal, I believe that I'm in Christ. I'm thirsty. You're thirsty as a Christian. The lost person is seriously thirsty. And I remember those lulls in my own Christian experience, times of utter thirst, where like Elijah we fall down and almost don't make it, parched. But I certainly remember times that seem to have been unconverted times, and many others testify of this, that there's a restlessness in the heart of man, and he is thirsty. You can see it, friends. Everyone you meet is dying of thirst in the desert. They're dying of thirst. Some of them, it's very obvious. In, in the addict clinic, or on the deathbed, or in prison, where you've been sent there for bankruptcy and fraud, or in the completely broken family with children who don't see their parents and so on. There are areas in life where the thirst is very obvious. And the brokenness shows that thirst for what it is and makes it unbearable for these people. A mother who doesn't see her children because of her own choices. An addict who's destroying themselves but keeps trying to quench that thirst with the thing. Families broken. All, in all of these areas, there are people out there, they're not satisfied. They cry every day. They feel depressed. They're despondent. No, nothing will work out for them. There's things that, unless God intervenes, are now unchangeable in their lives. Choices have been made. And these create thirsts, and rightly so. And even, even as Christians, we've made choices that cause these breaches and damage to us, others. And it, cre it shows us these thirsts. These thirsts are in the law of our nature. We're, ma we're made like God. We have thirsts of, of soul and mind. God made us... Um, thinking creatures like him we don't think the same as him but we aren't lions and elephants and so on we're very different you look at our body you look at the body plan of any mammal there's a lot of similarity it's a, it's amazing but this thing our spirit it, it it changes everything we're in the image of god and we have a thirst uh, for, for knowledge and understanding and, and seeing the world and understanding ourselves and where we came from and what life's all about and understanding others. And because of sin, that all goes wrong. I don't understand you. You don't understand me. We don't understand God properly. Our, our thoughts become disordered because of the fall. Sometimes they're clear. They veer off this way. They veer off that way. Our judgment is impaired. Wrong choices are made. And it's distressing. And your thoughts can become disordered. Someone can actually become so depressed that all their thoughts just become dark. There aren't good thoughts in there. It's just bearing the weight of a cannonball in your mind every day. Just black darkness. And you can't pull yourself out of that. 
and you're thirsty. We thirst for meaning. And you and I, if we're here, God willing, that means we've kind of tapped in to, to a plan for the world and so on that we believe it has meaning, that God's shown it in his word. But there's a lot out there now that have accepted atheism. They've argued themselves into it and other people following other religions. And they don't know what the meaning is. They don't know they have a spirit per se. They don't know what life's all about. They don't wake up every day and say, right, the reason I exist is to find God, to follow God, to live righteously, uh, to, 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 to submit to God. Um, and to glorify him, the gospel, the spread of his kingdom, all that's gone. It's been effaced from Western society, and people don't have meaning, and that's not good. So they're thirsty for it, so they'll find it elsewhere. They'll find it in the library. They'll find it by traveling, by joining causes, by visiting every country in the earth and finding new experiences. They'll, they'll decide to change their, their career or to go to a certain college or university and that, that gives them their purpose for a while. I started at A and here's my end game and I want to get there. Then they reach it and they say, well, what now? Then they have to find another purpose and then they follow that. We, we long for meaning. And if we're made for the Garden of Eden to know the very voice and face of the God who made us, if you remove him from that, we are going to be thirsty. Because all these little things we put in his place, of course they can't satisfy a soul that doesn't die, that's ongoing, that never fills to its brim of knowledge, experience, and love and relationship. The heart just craves and wants more. It wants these things. We're very different to the rest of the animal kingdom. We're made in the image of God and we're like him. And that's why people are so depressed today. That's why antidepressants have skyrocketed. I think it's 30% of the population is on some kind of chemical antidepressant or medication. That, that's an indictment on, on, on obliterating the gospel out of the public discourse, school and family and organizations. Man is thirsty and he's proud and he'll say, it wasn't the gospel that gave us those things. I'll find them elsewhere. And he keeps filling himself with things that he thinks will quench that first, but it doesn't work. All of these things we're thirsty for. Relationship. Why do we all get married? Why do we build friendships? Why do that? If we're just animals, if we're just evolved creatures, or whatever we are, why not just do what you want to do and just live for yourself? You don't need anyone. Atheists say that we do that because it's better to cooperate so then we'll be successful and get more. None of your hearts say that. That's not why you cry in your bed at night because no one will cooperate with you to help you get more resources. That's not why you feel lonely. You're not lonely because you have no one to co cooperate with you to help you build a city or get resources. The reason you cry is because man is spiritual and he cannot be alone. God isn't alone. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are thirsty. And we look for it in engagement rings. And $50,000 weddings. And friendships. And meeting people for, for coffee. And networking online. And looking for stimulation and inter interaction. That's because we're a relational being. We wither and die without that. Man thirsts for all of this. And underneath it all is this gnawing suspicion of guilt, of that things have gone wrong and they can't be put back together. The mind can't be put back together. You'd give yourself a three-month plan to put your life back together. And if it's unsuccessful, you fall flat on your face again and there's more despondency. We are thirsty people. We sense that something's not right in us. We sense that we might be guilty. We sense that we're probably going to die. 
we sense that one day we'll arrange a funeral. When we really think about it, we realize everyone we know will lose them one day. And we get out of bed and then we, we go out at 5 a.m. and we work to the grindstone and come home exhausted and ask, what, what's the point of it all? Man out there is thirsty. Now, I, I hope some of it is ministering to you, but I'm not only telling you so that you'll benefit from it. You're surrounded by these people. You're surrounded by them. I am too. They're thirsty. They're dying. They're parched. And they might do many things to cover up that guilt and, and deny it. But I know from my own experience when I try to suppress that instinct, even as a Christian, that there is this thing in us that just knows something's not right with us and with others and the way life goes. And it always disappoints. It always ends. It always ends up not working out in some way. It's not surprising or wrong that you're thirsty. You should be. This world isn't good, in ultimately speaking. It will harm you. It will do damage to you that won't be repaired until you're in heaven. It will damage your mind. It will damage your body, perhaps. It will damage your relationships. What was once good and beautiful and loving and the delight of your life, it may disintegrate and fall apart. It can happen. We're thirsty. All men are thirsty. And Christ says that they should come to him and drink. They should come to him and drink. And he's looking at them pouring out this water. And he's saying, it's just like me and my Holy Spirit. Man is thirsty, and it, there must be a drawing forth of water, and a pouring out upon the dry parts land of man's soul, if he's going to live and thrive in life and joy and reconciliation to God. It's only God's water that will do that. The work of Christ and the pouring out of his spirit and he is thinking of himself and his spirit as as proceeding forth from god the way this water is poured out for example um this water was taken from the pool of siloam and the jews attached significance to that because siloam means scent so the hebrew word for siloam is scent John actually points this out um, later uh, in, in chapter 9, verse 7. He, he just says something unusual. When Jesus is healing the blind man and tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, John says, that is in Hebrew, sent. And then it says, so he then sent him to the pool. So he's telling us in chapter 9 that Jesus sent someone to the pool and he, John is using the name sent to teach something spiritually. It was called scent. God didn't create it and call it scent. It happened to be called scent. But John uses that. The, the, the priests took the water from the pool of scent and they then were sent to the temple and poured it out. And Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but increasingly in this gospel, he does something unusual um, in what's recorded of his words in John's Gospel, he keeps referring to himself as the sent one. That isn't prominent in the other three Gospels, but it is in this Gospel, even in our own chapter. For example, uh, it's chapter 7, verse 28. Then Jesus cried in the temple as he taught and said, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. That's the theme of the passage. Jesus is looking at them drawing water from the pool of scent, and he's actually preaching in the temple saying, I'm the sent one. The Jews knew that this ceremony they were doing was all about the pool of scent. And Jesus puts that in his sermon. And you, in your own time at home, 
look through John 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and just count how many times Jesus says that he was sent. That siloam in Hebrew means sent. In Greek, you know the word. It's the word apostle, the sent one. So Jesus is coming forth here in these chapters in John when he's debating with them and saying, my doctrine is not mine, it is his who has sent me. I have not come on myself, but for him who sent me. I do not do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's telling the people that he's the one, that the apostle, the apostle, the messenger of salvation that has been sent from God, the Messiah, the Son of God, the only one who can speak on behalf of God. He is sent by God. He is the sent one. And these priests are sent down to the pool. They draw out the water. And there is a, a kind of sending ceremony. They bring it to the, uh, the courtyard of the temple and they pour it out. Now, Jesus is that sent one. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 tells us to consider the high priest and apostle of our faith, Jesus Christ, who was like Moses in all his house, though Jesus built a better house. It actually calls him the apostle, the sent one. Paul later says in the New Testament that when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made under the law. Then he says he sent forth his spirit. So there are two persons sent forth from the Godhead to enact the salvation that once the blood of one of those persons is spilled on the cross, it can save millions. And once the other person comes forth in his image here as water, as a refreshing, rushing stream from the presence of God, he can irrigate and give life to the heart of millions. Now, Moses or me or you could never do something like this. It has to be a divine person. One is sent so his blood would be spilled and the law fulfilled. The other one, and that gives forgiveness and salvation to millions, then the other one is sent into the heart of millions to be like water that brings irrigation and life and drink to that soul so that they don't die, they live. The theme here is sent. And Jesus was sent by his Father. Yes, Jesus is God in his divinity, but in his office as our Savior, he's, a, he's the servant of the Lord. He's commissioned and sent by his Father, and he has agreed to carry out all the requirements of redemption in his obedience in his life, in his death on the cross, in his resurrection, and every application of that to you, from the first moment you realized you were being wrestled with by the Spirit, and that you had conviction of sin, and that you began to believe in God and believe in Christ, the moment your heart turned in a different direction and it was regenerated and brought to life, these were all applications of the fact that a divine person brought that great worth to what he did on the cross, and that was being applied to your soul by the other person who is his companion, his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And he was sent. Christ was sent out to do all of that and to fulfill the covenant of grace. Now, as the sent one, Jesus can then say, if any man thirst, come to me. Come to me. He doesn't even say, come to the Spirit because you need him. Come to my Father. Most of the time he just says, come to me. Our gospel is Christ-centered. In, in a couple of places it's called the gospel of God. But it's mostly just called the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's there on behalf of the Trinity. And it all consists in him. And for the spirit to come into your soul, he first had to pay for all of that. And do all of that. And reveal all of that. He's the one who spoke these words. 
that people so often believe. I was given the Gospel of John as a child, and verses like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or blessed is he who has not seen, yet believes, these are the words of Jesus. It's Jesus' words we believe in. Yes, the Spirit gave him those words, but they're Jesus' words. He is the apostle and sent one of God. And he's standing in this temple here to the whole crowd saying, Come to me and drink. Not the priests and not the bucket and not the temple, but a person who looks like a man, but who is actually all the salvation of God bound up in him. Anyone can come to him. Anyone from any nation of the earth today, right now, anyone can go from being lost to eternally saved by coming to him. So Jesus is the one who can quench the thirst of your soul. And that's initially done through what he does on the cross, which is why he has the right to say, come to me. But secondly, he pours out the Spirit. The Spirit comes from Jesus. He comes from him. Jesus died for his people and he purged their sins and their sins were blotted out and so on but the soul that's dead and unbelieving and dark needs brought to life and it's the spirit of God that does that Jesus says come to me and drink verse 37 he that believes on me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow livers of water this he spake of the Holy Spirit. Now as they saw this ceremony, and there's hundreds of them standing there, it's a big courtyard. The, the, the courtyard is much bigger than this church building. Eight, eight times as big as the, this building, e easily. There's hundreds of people there, and they're watching the priests in concentric circles around the altar, moving into the altar and out in a circle, waving their palm branches, and this bucket is poured out, and Christ is saying that that's, what, that's speaking of the Holy Spirit. Now you'll notice in Scripture that the Holy Spirit, he's always spoken of in that way, or, or usually in that way. He proceeds from the Father and Son. He's not begotten. The Son is begotten of the Father, but the Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son, Jesus says in John 15. And that's depicted in the Old Testament by this word, pouring, pouring. He is poured out. It's not saying he is a person, is more like water than the other two members of the Trinity. This is said this way so we understand his work, the way he works. When the Spirit of God comes, when the third person of the Trinity, when redemption is enacted upon you, and he comes towards you, and indwells you to unite you to the son that's said of him in scripture as he is poured out just as you see when uh, baptisms occur here the water is poured out for example that's a picture of the holy spirit it gives the idea of an ongoing effulgence a rushing an abundance an exuberance now i'm not saying by the way uh, baptism has to be done that way that's for another time there's other modes of baptism like sprinkling but I'm just pointing out, just situationally, things like, if you go look at Niagara Falls, and you, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit. He is poured out. He, that's what a revival is, when the Niagara Falls opens over a desert. And I, I, I hope you know that today, he is not being poured out in that way. I hope you can see that. He is not... But he is the one who is poured out from God. And we're told that in Scripture. He is sent in the Father's name, and as Paul says, sent forth, but he's poured out. Isaiah 44, verse 4. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. Joel chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Isaiah 32. I will pour water on him who is thirsty. He's depicted as a pouring, a plethora, a, a, a pipe that bursts open 
and the water, the, the influence, the blessing, the life, it gushes forth. He's like a river or a fountain of water. And how much we need him to be that. So they look at the Siloam gushing up and they look at the bucket being poured out and it's a picture of the Spirit. Ezekiel 39, I will not hide my face from Israel anymore. I shall have poured out my Spirit on the house of Israel. The prophet Zechariah, I will pour out on the house of David and Jerusalem in that day a Spirit of grace and of supplication. All the prophets speak of the Spirit being poured out now friends it's jesus that poured him out and that still pours him out i don't know if you know that i don't want to assume that peter preaches on joel 2 at pentecost that's the great new covenant sermon about the holy spirit he takes as his text joel chapter 2 and he says we're not drunk with wine that's not what's being poured into us it's not wine but the prophet joel is being fulfilled he says that I shall pour my spirit out on all flesh. He says, that's, what hap that's what's happening, Peter says. He has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, and it is he who has poured out that which you now see and hear. So 50 days after his resurrection, from heaven, in his capacity as the mediator and savior and king of all, the king of kings, his great authoritative and royal act as our king was to authorize the further and abundant pouring out of the Holy Spirit. You'll notice that there's more activity of the Holy Spirit after the new covenant comes than there was in the Old Testament. It was limited to Israel. It was in a certain measure. It wasn't widespread. But after Pentecost, it flows out to every nation of the earth. Now you've got Christians everywhere. And you've had revivals in many centuries, sometimes many times in, in, in single centuries. But we don't have them now because his glory and grace are not being poured out in that way. But it's Jesus that pours them out. If you thirst, come to me and drink. Why? Because I can give you the Holy Spirit. Elsewhere it says the Father can give the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Trinity. But Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. You go to Christ and ask him to pour out his spirit in your soul so that you can be like those people who experience times of personal and national revival. We run around on our own steam and we don't receive this fullness of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on. It's not just your you're born again. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Those thirsts are quenched by the coming of the Holy Spirit into someone's life. So if you're thirsty out there and you're not born again, you must receive that Holy Spirit. He alone can bring you life and change you and transform you and turn you from self-destruction and sin and meaninglessness and futility and destroying yourself to turn you towards the wisdom and righteousness of God in your soul so that you can live like God and you can be like him, your heavenly father and grow into his likeness and the likeness of his son. What's shocking, friends, is how solemn, how solemnly blind the people in that temple were when Jesus said this and how it's an image of America today when, when Jesus said this the culmination of that ceremony was that they, the, the priest walked around the altar in a circle dozens of them singing Psalm 118 and all the other Israelites were there with a palm branch in one hand and a citrus branch in the other. And when certain verses came, they would shout hallelujah and they would shake their branches and move in a circle towards the priest and come back out. 
and keep doing that like there was a culminating moment come and they were waiting for this to be poured on the altar and the bucket was to be poured on the altar when they were singing that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord so it was their messianic expectation that the Messiah would come and pour out the Holy Spirit and they were singing it they loved the outward way of doing it they were singing it they, they sang the whole psalm the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone this is the doing of the Lord and it's marvelous in our eyes blessed is he who in God's na great name cometh us to save blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and the last verse of that psalm so solemn take ye the sacrifice bind with cords the sacrifice to the altar and that's what they did so they poured that out and they bound a bull by cords to the altar you know the bull is Christ the strong one the one who tramples his enemies perfect and without blemish but they're sacrificing a bull and they're singing blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord but they're all saying is he the Christ is he not the Christ and Jesus answers them and he cries out sometime around the ceremony I don't know when he did it but he cries out it's me I'm the one who has come in the name of the Lord I'm the one who's come I'm the one who quenches your guilt thirst your atonement thirst your unrighteousness thirst your sin thirst your love thirst your relationship thirst your knowledge thirst your quality of life thirst your eternal life first everything that everyone wants all the celebrities they all want to look young and live forever and enjoy themselves and have a perfect life and live in the Maldives and, and it's all they're wanting these drops of happiness these drops of paradise and they want to taste them and they go into Michelin star restaurants to eat a drop of paradise and then they drink their refined drinks because they want a mouthful of paradise uh, and, and they go on great trips and trek up into mountains and climb Everest because they want a drop of paradise or a drop of greatness a, a drop of immensity but it's just a drop the, it's God who satisfies all these cravings our guilt before the bar of judgment when we're before the state judge Jesus deals with that our hiking up Mount Everest is actually a search for God the eating of paradise and the pursuing of paradise and the lusting after paradise is a deformed thirsty version of the fact that God is beautiful God is great God is to be our awe they're all out there and they're chasing these things friends and it's actually God they need I'm almost finished here how how solemn it is for us right now with Gaza with Arab and Jew and the foolish Westerners who think they understand it and go on marches and everything that would be hacked to pieces by Hamas if they went anywhere near them. But Jesus is the answer to that thirst too. I want my land. You killed our children. We're going to attack you. We're going to infiltrate Israel and butcher you all to show you how worthless you are. We hate you. You're our mortal enemies. And Israel defending itself with weaponry, which it has a right to do under, under the Sixth Commandment. But the answer to all this, the, the, the displacement, the distrust, the dissatisfaction, is that Israel needs her Messiah, the Prince of Peace, to forgive her sin and bring new birth to their souls. And the Arab and the Palestinian need the Messiah. There is no peace without Christ. He burns the chariot. He breaks the bow and spear in pieces. He's the river that brings delight and gladness to the city of God. And when the Jews 
as Paul says, when they come to Christ soon and they all believe in him and they're born again and the Muslims come to Christ, then it will be life to the world, Paul says, because it will happen. The Jews will return to their Messiah. Blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord, they sang here as they rejected him. And Jesus gave a promise. You will not see, your house has left you desolate. You will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a promise from Christ. Christ has told us emphatically that when the Jews once again sing the end of Psalm 118 intelligently and they sing about him, it will be life to the world. They are desolate until they sing that verse to the praise of Jesus. Then Jesus will come. Then Jesus will come and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Anyone who thirsts in Gaza and Israel under immense suffering and wrongdoing on both sides, anyone who thirsts in their soul can look up now and seek the Father and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved. Uh, enough has been said uh, in the Spirit of God uh, in this sermon. Let me close with a comment as I uh, close this that when that comes into you or Jew or Gentile or whoever it is, it goes out to others. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And the same life and dynamism and satisfaction that is brought to you, that life you must give unto others. Go out there, friend, and be a conduit. Is the Holy Spirit flowing through your heart? It's a personal question. Now, these aren't games here. These aren't theology exams. Do you know the right answer? Is the Holy Spirit flowing in your heart? Do you know him? Does he show you Christ? He must flow through there like a river. And that river goes out to others. And the light of the truth and the righteousness and the grace and love that a Christian has in their heart, the compassion and long-suffering, show that to people, to Jew and Gentile, to Arab, to Muslim. Be respectful. Be hopeful. Be, be, on, be on a footing of conversion all the time. That's what you want. You want them to be your brother and sister. There's a time to not cast your pearls before swine. That's true. And some people hate Christians. But you look at everyone around you, no matter who they are in your neighborhood or work, and they're a potential brother and sister in Christ, and you go to them respectfully, with grace and love and understanding, yes, and certainty that the gospel's true. But don't, don't be a jerk to them. Don't, don't be rude to them. Don't get into a tit for tat with them. Don't misrepresent your master as though Jesus were ever petty or foolish or unkind. He wasn't. Be a river to them. Extend your hand out with a cup and offer them the only thing that will save them from dying from thirst in a desert, a hot scorching desert. May God bless these thoughts on his word this morning and may we put them into practice in our lives. Let's stand to call on his name in prayer.